Celia, I realize I have the dubious distinction of being the only thing that stands between us and the next glass of wine, so I'll try to keep everyone engaged, though. Um, my subject is a little bit of a hodgepodge because it's, it's, it's an attempt to give a little bit of perspective from the U.S., uh, which of course is actually quite heterogeneous, um, uh, and by no means do my words reflect everyone, if you will. Uh, but also, uh, we wanted to sprinkle in a little bit of unconscious bias and then of course highlight some of the work of uh, our co-sponsor here, uh, the Women in Thoracic Surgery. So uh, much like uh, Gunda just uh, discussed, uh, from Germany uh, in the U.S. in 2018 was the first year, the first time ever that women graduates actually, uh, women I should say outnumbered men in terms of medical school uh, uh, applicants as well as matriculants, which was a huge milestone for us. But when you look at the uh, various milestones that it takes for any given individual, male or female, to go from medical school all the way up to uh, American Board of Thoracic Surgery uh, certi board certification, uh, there is a pretty steep step off. Uh, although women represent about 52% of medical school graduates, they represent only 41% of general surgery trainees and only 20% of thoracic surgery trainees with about 5 to 6% representation in terms of American Board of Thoracic Surgery diplomats. So I don't, I don't know that it's a truly a leaky pipeline, but certainly there are places within here that there are significant amounts of uh, attrition or perhaps not really fully attracting people uh, and supporting those that, who have chosen uh, to enter into this profession that we need to try to address. So you can't really talk about uh, thoracic surgery, women in thoracic surgery in particular in the U.S. without mentioning Dr. Nina Starr Brunwald. She was the first, uh, the first woman to be certified by the American Board of Thoracic Surgery, which was in 1961. Uh, she was also the first uh, person uh, to successfully uh, implant a prosthetic mitral valve uh, in a human, which was in 1960. And she was also the first female to be elected to the American Association for Thoracic Surgery. All of these are pretty tremendous accomplishments, but the thing that I wanted to highlight too was the fact that she did all of this but while actually being a wife and a mother of three with a husband who was also uh, tremendously prolific and busy. If you look at her CV, though, um, the thing that I wanted to highlight is the fact that she had a tremendous amount of, of mentoring, at least very early on. Uh, she did her training predominantly in New York City. She was the first uh, female uh, surgical resident at Bellevue Hospital there in New York. Uh, and then her early career was at the NIH under Dr. Andrew Morrow. And he actually did something that went beyond mentorship, right? He actually truly sponsored her in her early career. Uh, he, provi he promoted her professionally, he provided resources for her, and he encouraged her in the development of her prosthetic mitral valve pic depicted here, the uh, Cutter Brunwald valve. Granted, this is all cardiac surgery, but the two are intertwined for us in the US. Uh, she did go on to publish 150 peer-reviewed publications, which is pretty prolific by, by most standards. But again, I think this is a little bit of a negative um, uh, bullet point at the end, which is that she also spent 24 years in a, as an associate professor, ending her career at Harvard, and was never actually promoted to full professor. So I think that's a pretty sobering um, epitaph, if you will, uh, given how amazing her career had been otherwise. She wasn't the only one board certified in 1961 by the ABTS. There were two other surgeons, Anne McKeel and uh, Nerman Tatunju. Um, the thing that I wanted to note uh, here, however, is the fact that it took another four years to get the next female uh, member uh, of the American Board of Thoracic Surgery certified, which was in 1965. So now I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, and go into the kind of the unconscious bias uh, or even conscious bias aspect of, of uh, what many of us who are women in thoracic surgery uh, uh, face each day. So I want to make the case for diversity. Usually, or, or often I should say, when you bring up issues of diversity, whether it's racial, ethnic, gender, what have you, this is the picture that comes to mind, is that 
Diversity is, is considered like a vegetable. It's uh, a part of a healthy and nutritious, well-balanced diet, but nonetheless, people are not necessarily super enthusiastic about it. And this is really where we want to get to. We want to get to the place where people can truly identify it as something that they should be excited about. So how do we get from point A to point B? Well, there are several arguments that have been put forth as to why diversity is important, and I'll go over a few of them. The first one is the morality or consciousness um, uh, rationale. Now, and that one is just, you know, we should be diverse because uh, equity is important and it's good and we are good people and we want good things for all kind of thing. Um, and that's great, but that's not necessarily the strongest argument for diversity. I think the strongest argument is that diversity itself is a marker of excellence. You cannot be a diverse institution, a diverse business, a diverse organization, I'm sorry, an excellent, uh, diverse, uh, an excellent institution, organization, what have you, if you don't have a diverse group of people who are actually innovating and coming up with the novel ideas, et cetera, and bringing all of those diverse perspectives to bear, for the newest thing that it is that your organization is trying to do, and medicine is no exception to that. There are also, in particular, in the uh, business world, major implications um, financially in terms of organizations usually that are not very diverse uh, when it comes to sponsorship uh, or in medicine when it comes to patient referrals or patient satisfaction. And then there's patient safety, which I think is probably a lesser known um, or lesser touted uh, rationale for the case of diversity. And I probably should have really couched this in sort of, uh, as a quality. Um, yes, safety falls under quality, but really there are significant differences out there when it comes to uh, the two genders, the two sexes, and, and how it is that we practice and, and, and operate even. What do we know about female medical providers? Well, this is, uh, these are all bullet points kind of culled from the literature, so it's not things I'm just making up, if you will, but women, at least from patients' perspectives, are perceived as being more careful. Um, they're also more likely to provide evidence-based care. That's certainly borne out in the lit literature. Their patient visits, if you will, um, are longer uh, on average. Not by much, but it's that little two minutes, apparently, that can make a big difference for patients. Um, they're also noted to demonstrate more empathy towards their patients, who in turn tend to disclose more medical and psychosocial details about their uh, histories and make for more positive statements in reference to their physicians. And in general, women, are th women uh, physicians are thought to be better communicators with their patients and their patients' families. So by no means are these things exclusive to women, but the point is that on balance, these are really good positive attributes that we should try to um, champion in all providers, right? And so if the bias is actually towards women and in, 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 in demonstrating and exhibiting some of these amazing attributes, why then does this significant disparity still exist? Um, and I'm sure there are many reasons for it, and this is, I'm just um, uh, pointing out one, which is gender bias. These are quotes uh, from women who are out there practicing that my colleagues and I solicited uh, when we were uh, preparing for a manuscript that's um, due to be coming out soon. But bias in itself um, are important to talk about. They're learned, behave they're learned thoughts. Um, they're socialized over time, and they actually, the foundations for them may be actually laid down during surgical training, um, either in, in medical school or afterwards. And the reason is, um, this is important, is because because bias in and of itself is not a bad thing. We all have biases. Um, in particular, in medicine, we use biases as mental shortcuts. We drill it into our trainees, pattern recognition. A patient of a certain age presents with a certain symptom set. These are their diagnostic tests. And what does that make you think of? It makes me think they have this, and the treatment is X. These are the mnemonics. These are the um, mental shortcuts that we drill into our trainees. And so biases, if you will, are just another example of that. And they, in and of themselves, are not inherently bad. The problem is when we have unconscious biases, which are either A, not recognized, or B, that we maintain and hold on to steadfastly, even in the present of uh, opposing information and data that would tell us that these are not accurate. And they can truly be harmful. Um, with regards to women in surgery in particular, there are a lot of ways in which bias has exerted its influence. Women actually report significantly more discrimination during their cardiothoracic residency training. Again, this is all US-based. 
than their male counterparts. And the sources of discrimination are not just men. It comes from everywhere. It comes from men, it comes from women, it comes from your attend other attendings, from residents, uh, from nurses and staff, and even the patients themselves and their families. So it's pretty pervasive. Um, and women are more likely to feel that the gender discrimination that they have experienced has been more detrimental to them in terms of hindering their career. The other thing to point, point out here is the fact that those, that uh, feeling of being discriminated against actually gets worse as you go up the hierarchy going from a trainee all the way up to an independently practicing surgeon. What about surgical training? Well, there's a big uh, um, uh, area here of surgical autonomy or intraoperative autonomy. Uh, this is a survey among thoracic surgery residents using this uh, Zwisch scale. And the faculty reported that their female residents were given less autonomy in the operating room and the female residents themselves further validated that and felt that they indeed had been given less autonomy. Well, that's a huge problem. I mean, we are in a technical field where one has to be confident in talking to the patient preoperatively and making them believe that you're going to be able to safely get them through uh, the gauntlet of surgery. So if you don't have the, the, the if you don't feel um, that you've been given enough autonomy, then that's going to undermine your confidence. Female residents do self-identify less as being a surgeon. Um, they feel that their professional role has, is more disregarded. And female surgical trainees actually feel, feel less prepared technically and less ready for independent practice, at least in this one study, which I think is really terrible because this flies in the face of the data. And again, these are the biases because the data themselves actually show that we perform, females perform just as well on our board uh, examinations and in job interviews. So again, holding on to a bias, even in the face of information that's contrary to that. And once you're out in practice, it doesn't end there. Um, there are issues in terms of interactions with colleagues. Again, we're, a, we're in a very high stakes technical field that requires a lot of assistance at times from colleagues to make sure that you can safely and um, uh, optimally do your job. And there are other implications for patient referrals. This study, which I thought was really interesting, said that referring physicians may actually view surgical outcomes more adversely when performed by poor surgical outcomes, when performed by female surgeons, which is reflected by a sharper decrease in subsequent referrals. So that's a big problem. And then lastly, if you are a female surgeon and you know that your trainees may evaluate you differently, you know that they may, may be different amounts of autonomy given or perceived, uh, and you may otherwise feel as if you're under a bit of a microscope, then that's going to be a really hard place for you to be able to thrive and certainly uh, not necessarily to innovate. And why do I bring all these things up? Because uh, collectively, there are actually microaggressions. So microaggressions have been likened to a mosquito bite. You can have one mosquito bite, it's not a huge problem. But if you have 100 mosquito bites, you could see how that would be a rather debilitating um, state to exist in. Um, and those mosquito bites, so these microaggressions add up and, 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 and become a, a, a major negative influence uh, cumulatively, and they, all, they, they, they basically culminate into burnout, and female physicians experience burnout to a much higher degree than their male uh, counterparts. So back to uh, the American Board of Thoracic Surgery certification. This was a nice graph, which basically uh, was, um, was created for the 2011 uh, celebration uh, by the women in thoracic surgery for the 50 to, 50 to 200, commemorating the first 50 years since uh, the first three women were board certified, and, the, and, and, and highlighting this as a milestone achievement, whereas we were actually able to get to 200. Uh, but it took 50 years to get there. So uh, the women in thoracic surgery, I think, has played a tremendous role uh, in creating that networking environment uh, that was just spoken of earlier. The uh, reason for its existence, if you will, is to promote and practice the highest quality of medical care for our patients, to mentor young women at all aspects of their career, and to inform the public about cardiac and thoracic disease in women and its rates of underdiagnosis and to work continuously to truly improve and develop our members professionally. So the WTS was founded in 1986 from very humble begin beginnings. Dr. Leslie Komen uh, actually started it by creating an informal breakfast, if you will, which was a gathering of female surgeons in conjunction with our two main meetings, the STS and the AATS. 
and it's grown considerably since then. But in her vision, she wanted to create an environment for sharing news, socializing, and networking across the barriers of geography, et cetera, that otherwise keep us rather disparate and keep us from being able to form that critical mass and creating a safe place to discuss some of these important issues. Um, uh, ultimately, she became the first president of the organization. The WTS has done a ton of work, um, uh, heavily focused on mentorship and scholarship. And in 2003, we created the mentorship program, uh, as well as the scholarship program, which were the first of their kind. And on the right, you can see sort of a list of our, our main scholarship and fellowship programs, um, which is actually going to be expanding even further uh, very shortly. This is what we look like, uh, WTS currently. We have 350 members. Our breakdown by membership category is depicted here. The largest um, um, proportion of members are full members who are all practicing uh, women in both cardiac and thoracic surgery. Uh, but the next largest demographic is the 40% who are represented by our candidate members who are all those who are in training, which I think is really amazing because it shows that these women are showing up and they're actually very hungry and eager to uh, capitalize on the uh, collective wisdom of the WTS. And this is our breakdown by specialty, subspecialty. Uh, this is what we look like internationally. We are an international society. We have 15 countries represented uh, from five continents. And this is my uh, shameless plug for Stanford. And I think some of the really cool things that are being done there at Stanford, uh, CT surgery is its own department. We have 40 uh, surgeons and scientists. Of the 40, there are six women on faculty, which is pretty tremendous. Um, we're doing a study currently, myself and another colleague, where we're looking at departments across the US. And the average number of female faculty in any given department or division is one. And about 30% uh, of the 76 uh, academic thoracic surgery units in the US have zero uh, females on faculty. So this is actually a pretty nice accomplishment. So in short, um, I think that we've uh, accomplished a lot of really nice things, uh, but clearly we have lots more work to be done. But nonetheless, we're very optimistic. We're positive this session is the embodiment of that optimism, and we think that the future is bright. So thank you. <laughs>